So welcome to yet another wonderful edition of Thinkly Talks, a place where we are in conversations and dialogues with some amazing people from around the world. So we're back today in Jaspeed's community, Plurality Dialogues. Jaspeed, welcome to you again. Thanks, Vivek. It's been a while. Great to be back. Thank right. you. And good to I see that you've... I was battling some viruses, not of the computer kind, the original ones. <laughs> no, no, no. Good to see you back, you know, absolutely. Uh, and... Um, you know, so Jaspreet, we, uh, as usual, have a, a very interesting uh, topic for today, uh, the rise of generative robots. Uh, and I think it's going to be very interesting to kind of unpack this one because uh, it kind of, uh, in some ways, lays to rest the whole thing around the Moravex paradox, right? And you kind of start wondering whether we've now finally turned the, you know, the corner on that one. But I think before we do that, let's just double down and do a quick recap of the things that happened over the last two weeks in AI. Last week, we went there because of Holi, so... Uh, allow me to just share the screen. You know, so I think, uh, Jaspreet, I think, uh, I think you've also kind of tweeted that, that nothing ever happens without Sam and Microsoft getting involved. You know, the moment we talk about AI nowadays, right? And I think this is one such week again, or one such, let's say, fortnight again, where re what you really saw on display was a fantastic, should I say, game of 4D chess all over again. You know, Satya Nadella playing pretty much in God mode, right? When suddenly, you know, there was an announcement saying that... Uh, you know, uh, Mustafa Suleiman, you know, a renowned uh, person in the whole AI world, the co-founder of, you know, DeepMind, which was bought over by Google, and then the co-founder of Inflection, uh, where I think he's raised close to $1.5 billion, you know. So he has actually been snapped up by uh, Microsoft and is going to head there, you know, the consumer AI initiative, right? Uh, there are a lot of things to be kind of, you know, you know, to be read between the lines, but you know, first your perspective, you know, just speak about this. No, Vivek, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Satya Nadella is showing himself to be a master strategist and tactician also. Yeah. And, you know, we saw some of that during the whole open AI debacle uh, that happened uh, earlier uh, or, or late last year. But in this case, it's very interesting. Uh, and, you know, it would be interesting to know how much, how long this has been brewing. Because yeah. uh, Microsoft has been the large, just investor, I think, in uh, in uh, uh, inflection uh, so far. And then if you look at the companies, the startups in the space, the ones which have become unicorn scaled up, I think are really four. You know, mm -hmm. there's obviously OpenAI. Okay. And then there was inflection and there's Anthropic and now there's Mistral. You know, uh, these are the four big ones in that sense. Uh, there's also stability, which is going through its own instability right now. Uh, but the other four, and I think with this, what he's done is that uh, of the lot, it can also be argued that inflection was not doing the best. Claude mm -hmm. has made its mark. Uh, OpenAI, obviously, Mistral has made its mark. But uh, Pi, which uh, 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 Suleiman and inflection brought out with is not really, was not really, you know, up there with the other three. And so I think he's kind of eliminated one so as to have less competition. Okay. Uh, for not only for the consumer, but also for GPUs yeah. uh, and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, gotten in some great talent, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. And most importantly, in my opinion, built a hedge against something happening again at OpenAI. One of my predictions this year, I write 10 predictions every year. Mm -hmm. and, soon, and later this week, we'll have the quarterly update of those predictions was mm -hmm. that either uh, OpenAI and Microsoft will get married or get divorced. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I think uh, this is a hedge against a possible divorce. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't know whether you came across the leaked emails uh, about uh, Satya writing to his investors or the board members, you know. Uh, they said, look, don't worry about OpenAI. We are below them. We are above them. We are alongside them. The IP is ours, you know. So you can see that, you know, obviously the board, and obviously Satya Nadella, with the kind of investment that they've done and that kind of hedge that they've taken, you know, really with them, they would be a worried lot, right? But uh, do you think the speed that this, uh, you know, people have been speculating that the acquisition has been of the talent and I think a lot of the team, not the company. So there is speculation that this whole acquire hire approach is to kind of avoid any, you know, you know, antitrust issues because anybody would argue right now they they by far are the dominant force in AI, right? Any thoughts on that? No, absolutely. Well, one, it's what's a cheaper way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Buying the entire company, which at a whatever few billion dollars valuation would have been more, uh, more expensive. Uh, right. Second, absolutely. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head that it is, uh, uh, it's to avoid antitrust. Uh, the regulators aren't going to be very happy by this 
devious play in a sense. <laughs> But uh, I think, yeah, that's the whole 4D chess thing, right? Maybe we should call it 5D chess now. There's a dimension he's playing in which we don't even know. And right. uh, uh, this is another another big uh, uh, another big reason. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the legal counsel in Brad Smith must be really working overtime to make this happen, right? Uh, but, you know, one last thing before we kind of move on is uh, what do you really see this whole consumer AI thing? You know, because I think there was a little bit of, again, I think... Uh, on this beast ka issue between the way Satya Nadella put it across and the way, you know, Mustafa talked about it. Do you see any conflict about what exactly would entail when you talk about consumer AI? Uh, because obviously they're talking about co-pilot, Bing and everything. And then people say then what's really left out apart from enterprise. But that's also covered in this uh, in some ways. I, yeah, I look, both of us have been at Microsoft. So we know there's always ambiguity. Okay. Right. And uh, so I'm... I'm sure there's some organizational ambiguity. I think the enterprise AI in many ways is subsumed by the cloud in many ways, right? right? That's so right. I don't see an enterprise AI division in that sense because I think that will be a part of the, it will be subsumed by the cloud. But uh, yes, there was some controversy, but very frankly, I think too far away from the organization to, right. and I don't know right. enough of the gossip inside to know what's really happening. Right, right. But I think you nailed uh, uh, one point very well that this is a hedge against Sam. And, you know, as usual, we are in a meme world and there was this fantastic meme going around saying this is what Sam's reaction was when he heard about the acquisition saying, OK, you know, now how the hell did this happen? Right. Uh, but then, you know, we, we talked about Satya playing 5D chess right now. Right. And uh, just when you would think that, you know, you know, Sam might probably start getting worried or plotting something. This is what Satya Nadella dropped again. And this was really about. Uh, the fact that a $100 billion commitment or, or at least plans to kind of invest, you know, along with OpenAI to set up really a vast uh, data center and especially also the supercomputer that they're calling Stargate. So some thoughts about that. Well, first of all, I love the name Stargate. Yeah. Okay. I think it's it's good, ambitious. You know, it's it's not called supercomputer version 3.26 enterprise or something like that. Okay. Which is what has started really happening with companies like Microsoft. Now Google does that. Very well. Uh, but, um, um, you know, this has a couple of things here. So one is that it is it, it actually still shows that the newer models are being built by throwing more compute at the model, mm. you know, rather than only doing other things. I'm sure they're doing other tweaks also. Right. But in many ways, I, I guess both the companies have realized that to move to the next level, you have to throw far bigger compute okay at at this model and that's what stargate is doing in fact some reports i've read say that it's not 100 is the minimum it's going to be more like 115 120 which by the oh. way is more than two times microsoft's annual r d budget and right. microsoft has a fairly hefty 50 billion dollar budget uh, so it's a huge huge commitment uh, the other thing that I see here is uh, how this plays out vis-a-vis -vis Anvitya. Mm -hmm. okay, because, you know, uh, you know, will this 150 billion or whatever billion dollar supercomputer be formed of Nvidia GPUs? Or will it be the new Microsoft Maya, uh, 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 you know, servers, GPUs that they've been talking about? Mm -hmm. And I kind of bet that there will be, it will be on the latter. Because, you know, they do want to, I think it's also a play... So the first one was a hedge against uh, uh, OpenAI. I think this is a bit of a hedge against Nvidia. Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting report which came out, Frank, also was that you know one of the things they are talking about is whether the cables connecting the servers would be Nvidia's cables or not. I believe Nvidia also designs and manufactures those cables and mm -hmm. then self cost a bomb. So I think they are kind of looking at this uh, one to bear out this big compute thing, uh, and second as a bit of a hedge against uh, NVIDIA. And look, at the end of it, it's also shock and awe tactics, right? Uh, right. You know, you're kind of throwing out something so that the competition sits up and people have already been predicting a $300 billion supercomputer coming from Google or, you know, or whatever. But that's how I see this. Now, we are in for some insane amount of investments happening in this space. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whether the 300 billion happens or not, or the 100 billion, I mean, the sheer scale is something else, right? Well, I, I, I have written about the fact that uh, 300 billion Google and Amazon will say, I want to do 500 billion and Elon Musk <laughs> is going to talk about a trillion billion, trillion yeah. dollar giga, giga computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. As long as Elon is around, things are always interesting, right? Yeah. 
And I think that brings us to the the buy note, the foot line about a small, you know, two and a half billion dollar investment in Anthropic, right? I mean, the the scale is so different right now. But yeah, I mean, how exactly do you think Anthropic is uh, is doing right now with Amazon doubling down? And I think it's finally made a four billion dollar owns majority of the company, I believe. And yeah. See, in the proprietary LLM space, I think it's GPT and Google and Claude. Okay, yeah. GPT and mini Claude. So I think that three sum is kind of getting set now. And Claude is obviously from Anthropic. And then obviously they're open source with Mistral and Meta's Llama, etc., which is a separate deal. But I think, you know, you know, if you go back, even Michael Porter, etc., used to talk about these rule of threes that eventually, like yeah. it happened with cloud providers, you know, it's eventually three people. And therefore, I think Amazon and Google also, by the way, has invested in Anthropic. Uh, mm -hmm. And they kind of have... Uh, uh, realize that this is the uh, horse to back because OpenAI is gone and uh, uh, Google is Google. Uh, but uh, the other um, interesting thing here is it's also a war of the cloud. Okay. And um, since OpenAI is wedded to Microsoft and so Microsoft's cloud will, you know, they'll create this cloud, this supercomputer, et cetera. Here, in fact, while they're investing 2.75, taking it up to a total of four, uh, it's still not exclusive to AWS and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Anthropic is in fact, is at a position where it can hedge between Google Cloud and uh, AWS and in a sense hold them to ransom as to where they get more investment. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's it's kind of being played from both sides. I think it's a game of poker and counter intelligence combined, right? I mean, each one is making its own play. You have no idea hedging, counter hedging. I mean, this is going to make some interesting movie, I think a few years down the line. I, and, you know, just, just before we move along, uh, do you see, I mean, you made a very interesting uh, observation that, you know, the rule of three, that there is some consolidation that eventually happens, right? Somebody will dominate 50%, then 50% of that, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, do you see us that now after all this huge play that have happened, over, I would say, over the last two, three years in uh, the foundational models, the next round of investments will probably be more focused now really on the application side, on the devices side, and then the robotic side, right? Because this play seems to be like the old OS play. Uh, now more, more and more, they'll start looking like each other. The compute can only take you so far. You know? So really, do you think that will be the next big play happening? Uh, no, I think this play will also continue. So while okay. all those other things will happen, it's everything everywhere all at once, as I, as the mm. movie said. Okay, so, mm. uh, but because in the large language model space, while it would kind of probably consolidate to three or four, and then there'll be the open source guys. Remember that too. Okay. Right. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think we have really solved anything yet. Okay. And I think, mm. uh, uh, you know, until quote unquote AGI, I think bulk of investments are still going to go in my opinion on the, uh, on the basic models, because those models itself are at their beginning while right. it might come down to that. They're going into three of those or four of those. But I mm. think a bulk of the investments will still continue going to the lower end of the stack. Uh, right. and especially the big tech investments. Uh, right. But yes, the innovation investments would start and have started moving up uh, right. the stack, uh, including going to hardware, which I think is what we are going to be chatting Absolutely. about. Yeah. Right. And I think on that note, I'll just quickly move across to the topic today, generative AI. And I think just want to show one reel that's from around two weeks back uh, when uh, Figure and OpenAI announced their collaboration. Uh, so I'll just quickly play that read. And there's one other short 30 second video I want to show after that. So. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Yeah. You know, so I think a lovely clip which showed the AI really conversing. And I just wanted to show this other clip, uh, maybe 10 seconds of this one. Uh, it's a 
from uh, Brimen's uh, this thing. I, yeah. Next, we have a video of the Unitree robot breaking humanoid land speed records. Imagine this thing chasing you. Next, we have a robot from Boston Dynamics, something you've probably seen already, but this one is moving heavy objects with insane precision. Yeah, that's it. I just wanted to, I'll pause out here. No. So, Jaspeet, I mean, we are just seeing some fantastic developments happening right now in robotics, right? I mean, at one side, you see the whole power of Gen AI, uh, and of course, now that Genera is also text-to-speech, right? So you see the robot talking to you, conversing with you, pausing when he talks about why he gave you the apple in between. That's like, I gave you uh, the apple because, you know, so it was as realistic it can be. And on the other side, you know, where typically when you've seen the problem with robots when it comes to sensory perception about really the motor and uh, stuff like that, you know, suddenly it's all exploding and seeming to come together all at once. So, you know, what's your thought? Maybe you could begin by saying that how is this generation of Gen AI robots different from what we used to call robots. Yeah, actually, the action is moving beyond robots to a super set of hardware. Okay, uh, you know, so we've been so far in the generative AI space, we have been seeing a lot of action obviously happening and continuing to happen in software. Okay, creating new models, newer models, etc, etc. But over the past few months, actually, the action has moved to the hardware space. And someone said very interestingly that in this space, hardware seems to be eating the world, not software, because most of the investments are going into hardware. Uh, even behind uh, the large language models, uh, the most of the money is going into NVIDIA's GPUs, which is hardware, or TSMC's chips, which are hardware. Uh, and now we are seeing, uh, you know, these uh, humanoids, etc. But let's kind of keep that hardware, overall hardware part aside, which we can talk about also, but talk about this. Uh, I think there's a key difference, as you yourself are hinting at, between the figure robot and the Boston Dynamics, Boston Dynamics, right? Boston? Yeah, Boston, that's correct. Boston Dynamics, uh, 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 robots. And the Boston Dynamics robots have been around for the longest time. You know, uh, YouTube videos and Twitter feeds are... Uh, full of, you know, these dancing robots, crawling robots like a dog, dogs and robots, and, you know, things like that. But most of those robots are industrial robots. And they were, as 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 you showed in your video itself, you know, the lifting heavy stuff, you know, a precision uh, screwing in a precision way, etc. And the problem there has been very different, I think. And so, you know, you could, they're not humanoid as much. Mm -hmm. I think the humanoid one started happening more and more. You know, we started seeing Sophia coming yeah. in, uh, mm -hmm. who incidentally is a citizen of the UAE right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we saw uh, Optimus from uh, yeah. Tesla. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And now we are seeing a figure. Uh, figure, by the way, I think is probably the most funded uh, uh, robotic company today. Uh, mm -hmm. Two point something billion dollars and all the big names are there. But I think the key difference between figure and the others is that figure is really a hardware extension to a large language model, you know? And so, you know, it's kind of understanding, so it's powered by its OS in a sense, I don't know too much in depth, but it's OS in sense, its operating system is a large language model. Okay, mm -hmm. and that is, I think there's exciting new direction, okay, which mm -hmm. has uh, happened in humanoid uh, robotics. And, and this area, I think will be the, fastest growth uh, and probably will be the way to create non-industrial, more consumer-oriented uh, humanoid robots, the ones which were supposed to have washed our dishes and cleaned our rooms and done our shopping and taken care of our older uh, parents and babysat our children, I think will be these these new class which are, which are coming now as opposed to the Boston Dynamics one. Right, right. In fact, I think even Elon has talked about that, uh, you know, he's long on Tesla, obviously because of his EVs, but he really believes that eventually, you know, the robots that, you know, that they're building out uh, are the ones which can probably be there with every human being, right? Everybody can potentially, I mean, the, I think the time of the market that he's predicting is huge. Uh, there's an interesting question here on that uh, from Anand Sharma. He said, do you believe that eventually generative robots are capable of designing new products by themselves? You know, and I think we've talked about 
self replicating code and the new code i mean we you know when we talked about it but uh, and that that obviously is a little what should i say can be hurtful to the you know to 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 humans but i would imagine that uh, robots just you know <laughs> that new line of code for the way they run and walk and i mean we obviously yeah. Are, again yeah yeah you know i i see this in an interesting construct so i think you know if you think about what mostly microsoft is talking they are talking of these copilots right and these copilots right. are software copilots you know which help you write a document or solve a problem or think of something or write a novel or whatever probably with these we'll probably have hardware copilots i mean literal copilots like a like a physical copilot okay right. uh, uh, with you who is helping you so you could do certain things with your software copilots obviously you know work and you know but there are many things which you would do with a we can do with a hardware co- with a robotic copilot okay yeah. um, i mean in the industrial world they are called cobots okay mm. where you know it's a cobot as the name suggests is human and robot and uh, working with each other the the robotic arm is doing the heavy lifting and the human is doing whatever you know precision stuff that needs to be done and i think similarly so you know literally each one of us could probably have a hardware robot but coming to the question which sorry i forgot who, who asked the question uh, uh, anand sharma anand uh, i i i think uh, self replic i mean i think creating stuff frankly i don't think we even need robots for that you know the code itself you know at the end of it creating new stuff a lot of it is actually the the inside stuff which is the software okay and i think you know you don't need a robotic person sitting and typing software okay to create some new program i mean that can happen through a software agent itself a software robot itself uh, uh, and many robots actually are software robotic process automation as rpa as we know is all 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 software robots they are not hardware robots uh, but maybe if your question was more towards will a robot be like building a new kind of car yeah. uh, you know possibly but that's more musk elon muskian territory frankly uh, mm-hmm. it's kind of a little far off but what i do see possibly amongst the initial users okay, talking of elon musk are potentially humanoid robots which are colonizing other planets you know because right. humans can do that uh, right. biology prevents you from doing that and uh, a silicon based and a, a silicon and metal based object could do that right you know there's an interesting question here and i think uh, would probably help us you to just come down a little you know because there a lot of people trying to figure this out is it that aniket said that can any we easily operate a generative robot or does it require specialized training and i think it would be good for you to articulate as to why you know this whole human machine interaction in the way we talk about is going to change yeah 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 so no, that's a good question and who was that please if uh, uh, aniket aniket uh, it's a good question see the promise of generative ai is not just about a chatbot okay or about some new joke being created or you know someone summarizing pdf documents which are great you know never happened before but but i think as gartner put it very succinctly uh, uh generative ai is not just a technology or a trend it is a fundamental shift in how humans and machines uh, work with each other or communicate with each other and and that's very insightful and very profound and very important uh, because for the first time now we are at a situation where a computer will learn your language rather than you learning the computer's language so far we had to learn python or c or whatever and now you know prompts done well are nothing but program okay or coding in some sense okay and so it has become natural language interfaces in many way the promised natural language interface and soon it's going to move to voice uh being the pre predominant uh, ui uh, uh uh and so if if i were to therefore come to the robotic part of uh, uh, uh you know the story I, i think as we saw in the very early video which figure brought out which is actually figure 1 right uh, yeah a very early video which figure brought out you know the guy talks in i mean the human being talks in very natural uh, normal language you like you don't need training to do chat gpt i don't think yeah. you need training to uh, work with a, a natural language uh, with a um, llm or a generative ai based robot i think that's the whole idea that you know that that barrier goes away right i think that's where it starts becoming really powerful because the accessibility and everything ends up being so different yeah 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, so so I think the other question out here is, uh, you know, uh, Anna was asking, what are the main challenges or limitations currently facing generative robots? I mean, uh, in your mind, uh, I mean, they obviously have come a long way, but what is stopping them from really, uh, you know, getting to scale? Is it going to be the cost? Is there some other elements? Uh, and what are researchers doing to address them? Anything that you might be able to dwell upon? You know, it's a very very initial area. In fact, I don't think they have come a long way. I think they have just started. Right. You know, what we saw today was the first ever prototype, okay, of a generative AI robot, at least which was demoed. Maybe there's stuff in the labs, etc. But I at least haven't seen anything. I've seen the dancing dogs of Boston Dynamics, but that's different. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and and you know, I'm, I'm 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 so far away from being a robotics expert that I'm kind of almost you know hesitant to answer because it's such an amazing field with some amazing people. So I'll keep it very general. And so the thing about hardware is that it's hard. It really mm -hmm. is hard. Okay, it's a very hard thing to do. And that's why, you know, despite all, all his uh, eccentricities, Elon Musk needs to be really admired because he does the hard stuff. You know, it's not just about creating a great new uh, uh, advertising uh, engine or, uh, uh, a, or a software agent or a mm. uh, new chatbot, you know, he kind of translates that into actual hard working stuff and, you know, cars and spaceships. And if you again look at how long it took for him to build, put a rack, rocket out, you know, there were like at least 10 crashes. And even now with this big rocket, you yeah. know, it cra it's like on his third crash or something. Third crash. Like, yeah. yeah. And there'll be a couple more crashes. That's how it works, okay, with hardware. And so I think I think we are at the beginning, frankly, okay, for generative AI robots. And we're going to see a lot of failures, a whole lot of failures, okay, before something real and usable uh, comes along, just because hardware is a very, very, very difficult thing to do because it's not just code, you know, there are actually things which have to move things which don't have to fall down, uh, uh, you know, you, you just moving our thumbs like this, twiddling our thumbs takes, I believe, some 40 or 45 muscles doing different movements. Right. Okay, and so it's just very really difficult. And to make a humanoid do will, is going to take, that's why it's it's difficult to do. Right. You know, there are a few questions there by from Meera, Varun, I'm just trying to, you know, conflict some of them. Uh, if, you know, they're trying to say that, how do you imagine the world to be? You know, like, for example, which industries do you expect will get transformed? How do you think will be a day in a life of a, of a human, you know, who's, let's say, living a privileged life and all that, you know? Uh, just me, I think you should probably dedicate your next article on in Mint or something about, let's say, life in 2030, surrounded by all these Gen AI robots or something like that, you know? Uh, and soon I'll be called a futurist then. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're in AI world, I mean, you already are, right? But but one foot on that side but i mean i have you i mean i'm just saying obviously we will obviously all of us will go wrong because we just can't imagine but i'm sure you've contemplated speculated what the world would be how would it be in 5 years from now you know there are different scenarios mm -hmm. okay uh, so let me take the most dystopian scenario and the most utopian scenario and Fantastic. hopefully somewhere in the middle okay because the most dystopian scenario let's start with the bad news okay um which uh, is painted often by Yuval Noah Harari, among others. Okay, mm -hmm. is is the fact that you know you'll have all these humanoid robots out there and also software. Okay, and every single value-producing activity that mm -hmm. human beings do, which create value. Okay, whether it be a factory worker or whether it be a farmer or whether it be a software engineer or whether it be a nurse. Okay, which creates value. Uh, will be taken or will be replaced by either software or hardware or a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. okay. And so human beings will not have to work anymore. Now, that is not a utopian view. That's a dystopian <laughs> view. It's a bad view. It's a dark view because, mm -hmm. you know, while it sounds amazing. And so he says that, you know what, maybe all the, and so because these robots will be so much better than us, they'll create infinitely more or uh, quantum more value than we do. And so all the wealth created, okay, will actually be distributed amongst uh, the rest of us who are doing nothing, uh, biological life forms. And so we are sitting, as he says, the entire day playing video games. Okay, and now maybe for a few of you, this would sound very uh, nice, but it isn't. I mean, we'll, we'll probably see a suicide rate 
close to 100%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because human beings need a purpose to live. And so if we kind of cede control of everything, even if we're getting money in return, money is not going to fill that void in our lives, uh, which uh, is much bigger than just money. And so that's the dystopian view 30 years from now. The utopian view is that, look, we will figure out the right balance and there'll be a lot of work uh, which uh, 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 which human beings are doing, which should not be done by them. Okay, uh, uh, dangerous, uh, working in dangerous places, even waging war, um, you know, uh, manual scavenging, uh, doing uh, heavy duty construction at for skyscrapers, which is dangerous. Truck driving, by the way, I believe is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Uh, funnily, yeah. not because of accidents, but because one side of your body gets all the sun and you get skin cancer on one side. Okay, it's oh. crazy. Okay, crazy stuff when you kind of go into details. And so, you know, they'll not be truck drivers and there'll be robots who will be driving. So all these jobs, which are dangerous, will be done by humanoids and others, while jobs which are, you know, and work, the kind of work with compassion. I mean, I still think that, you know, while there could be a robot helper for an old person, the old person still needs a human being. Okay, to take care of her uh, also along with that. And so I think the, the utopian part, therefore, is that, you know, we'll be at this stage where all of these will work with us as co-pilots and uh, the world will be a much, much more productive and much, much more happier uh, place because we won't have all the dangers, as you say. Yeah. So you choose which one uh, you like and uh, hopefully we'll be somewhere in the middle. Right. You know, and, and on, on point with that, you know, where there are a couple of questions, again, I'm, you know, uh, you know, conflating what Lavanya and Sakshi are asking, saying that, uh, you know, when you when I did your course on AI ethics and society, right, how much at that point in time was this whole thing around robotics coming in? Because, you know, I mean, uh, were you also at that point in time contemplating, you know, the whole you know onslaught of these kind of things? So what kind of ethical consideration one could imagine right now when you when you debate these topics? Lavanya, Sakshi, you weren't even contemplating large language models. <laughs> Yeah, you actually did that before LLMs, right? Yeah, we started, I started in uh, September 21 mm -hmm. and it was supposed to, and it ended in uh, July, August 23. Bang right. in the middle, everything changed. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and I think, I mean, I, for one, for example, you know, really wanted to, if, I, if this had happened a year before, my entire two years would have been de dedicated to understanding mm -hmm. ethical issues around large language models because they're just so much more and so different, okay, from or yeah. machine learning okay or uh but i don't think we even we even we even thought of those forget robotics uh but but having said that there is one and you know one day i'm sure we'll, we're going to do a talk on this also but the humanoid part and the ethical dimension which we did study and people have been studying a lot as is about human robot relationships uh, uh you know and, and by relationships i mean even romantic relationships okay yeah. or or friendly relationships or who knows going forward they could be or, or colleague co-worker relationships okay and so that is a huge area social ai huge area of uh, interest and research we touched upon that a little bit but frankly we didn't have enough time to uh, hmm. go into even large language models forget about robotics right right no, I mean, we're just uh, into some very interesting, uh, what should I say, uncharted territory over and over again, right? And I think one thing that uh, makes me think is that, you know, when you look at, when you look at, let's say, movies like for the iRobo, when you look at the R2-D2, when you look at, let's say, even Foundation, where apparently there's not a single robo in the galaxy, you know, uh, there's only one, uh, I think Dermotzel, at least in the Apple's version of it was, was a robo, right? Uh, and I think all of them come down to the simple, you know, laws of robo that they have to always follow. That's apparently, so even Dermot can, could, you know, cannot do certain things because, you know, she's apparently bound by that law. I robo, obviously, you had finally a robo, which, uh, so do you assume that eventually, I think every boot of the, you know, booting up of a, of a robo would possibly, in, uh, you know, invoke these kind of zero laws. And there I see regulation coming in, for example, the government wanting to kind of ensure that there's going to be any, any thoughts on that? No, no, that's a good, that's a good thought. And, you know, again, we've talked about this, but science fiction predicts what's going to happen 30, 40 years, sometimes, sometimes uh, in advance. Mm -hmm. And when Isaac Asimov created his three laws of robotics, legendary laws of robotics, um, 
you know, uh, it, it was actually created for an era when these robots will be there and will actually be stronger, more powerful, maybe more intelligent than human beings. And therefore, how, you know, these should not harm a human being. And I think a version of those three laws, obviously, we need to kind of, you know, evolve them more. Uh, and also bring in some kind of a Hippocratic oath of first yeah. do no harm. Uh, and, you know, kind of create something which uh, not only when you boot up a robot, frankly, I think this is also going to happen for when you write a large language model. Okay. And mm. uh, uh, those haven't been codified yet and those standards aren't there yet. But the key thing which people are wanting to do is to codify this to set up some standards uh, so that, you know, those become integral to uh, building both software as well as hardware. And certainly SMO's three laws, along with others, will, will, play, a, will play a strong role in that. Right. You know, so for people, I think, who are very keen on being in this area, uh, you know, of course, you know, you had Jensen, uh, Juan, who made a very interesting statement that if you're interested to look, really do computer programming, just focus on knowing good English so that, you know, th that's how the world is moving towards. But uh, still on that front, uh, anybody interested in focusing on the field of AI, spe uh, specifically generative robots, what do you think they should be looking at doing? Ah, so Jensen Wang's statement, I don't think is valid for AI robots. Mm. Okay. It probably mm. is valid for software programming. Okay. At a point of time. Okay. Uh, uh, which is that you don't really need computing language. You need only international language. And I do believe I agree with him. I think that's the way the world is going. But I think building a robot is a different story. Uh, mm. And we talked about how hard hardware is. And so, you know, I think, and, and, and I think a couple of things happened in the, in the last few years. The software guys became more glamorous than the hardware guys. And overall tech guys became more glamorous than the rest of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think both of that is going to change. You know, uh, I think humanities, languages, uh, logic, uh, grammar, people are going to become as important, if not more than software people. Mm -hmm. And also uh, hardware guys are going to actually become more uh, uh, important than software. Even today, I mean, I was listening to an Andre Karpati uh, interview and he was saying that there are software issues, sure. But what we don't see is below the hood, the hardware problems are bigger. You know, mm. how 10,000 GPUs work together. Okay, yeah. how to make that happen. And uh, I, I also again recently read that uh, AI hardware people and uh, uh, chips people, semiconductor people, hardware people are are twice or thrice better paid than AI software or data scientist people. Mm. Okay. And so I think that field of study uh, is clearly going to be massive and it's not going to be just replaced by natural language. You need to know engineering. Yeah. Right. And that's what you should be uh, looking at. Right. I think this on that point, uh, you know, when you talk about the, the talent issue uh, and how people are differently calibrated, paid, compensated, right? Uh, there was, I think, a very interesting uh, post that you had written about the whole fight for the talent among the big tech companies. You know, I think, I think, I think the audience here would really love to, you know, hear your thoughts around that uh, and really your observation as to what's happening. There are three things which are, I think, everyone is fighting over in terms of creating the next big large language model. Mm -hmm. Compute is one, and therefore Nvidia share price. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, data is another. Okay, and where do you, and therefore all the synthetic data and, you know, corporate data, et cetera, et cetera, being fought over Reddit, uh, New York Times, all of that stuff. And the third, obviously, is talent. And while there are a whole lot of data scientists, whole lot of whatever, again, Andre Karpati was saying, it's not that you just give a guy saying, I'm giving you unlimited GPUs uh, to create a large language model. Not going to happen. Uh, right. According to many people, there are less than 100 okay, people in the world, mm -hmm. okay, who can actually, given the right resources, create a world-class large language model, which has world-class hallucination or whatever parameters and energy parameters and precision parameters, they say less than 100. And each of them are paid in millions of dollars mm -hmm. and uh, guarded by thick high walls by them. So, uh, you know, recently, uh, you know, with 
Google's floundering a bit in the AI thing. Uh, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is reportedly making direct calls to named researchers in mm. DeepMind to poach them. One I wonder them, how the, I wonder how those calls would go, right? <laughs> Well, you know, whatever you're getting, I'll double it or whatever. And but that also, you know, there's also this whole thing about the open source movement and a lot of tech people wanting to join that. Maybe Karpati mm. also might end up going there mm. uh, to the open source, not meta, but to the open source movement. And then the other bit, uh, then the other anecdotal stories about how when Google guy was actually leaving, not to go to meta, but to open AI, uh, uh, Sergey, Larry, Sergey Brin, uh, Mm -hmm. called him up and told him whatever and basically gave him a blank check to stay. So, well, if you're one of those 100 guys, you're very lucky. It's the right time for you to make a lot of money at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think just doubling down on, on this whole talent issue, what do you see, what are the opportunities you see for Indian tech guys in India and entrepreneurs? Because obviously when it comes to the whole sheer compute power or building a foundational model of that sort, I mean, Valley is way ahead of the rest of the world, right? And maybe a few more spots here and there. But what do you think uh, is happening? And of course, there have been some play with our, uh, you know, Indian LLMs also, right? What, what is your observation in that area? Well, I won't have a very patriotic answer to this, to be very honest with you. <laughs> I, I think that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, and again, it depends on Indians in India versus Indians outside India, the old story. Right. I mean, you know... We're talking about the Indians in India. I think let's look at that because... Uh, sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. interestingly, three or four of the people who wrote the attention is all you need paper, which started off everything, have right. Indian descent. So I think there's for uh, perplexity is guys of Indian descent, etc. You know, so Indians outside, the, the world's your oyster. Absolutely. Uh, because all the other issues are there. I think here, my fear is that we are not equipped enough or have the mindset or the resources to do real deep tech in this space. Uh, there are some promising signs. I especially like what the Sarvam guys are doing with their with their models. But you know, Sarvam has been, for example, capitalized with $40 million. Okay, which is a lot of money for a seed round in India or a series A seed round, whatever you call it, in mm -hmm. India. I mean, unheard of a $40 million round, okay, at that level. But $40 million does nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. in this space okay not even you know you're not sitting at the table you're not at not table stakes also you need hundreds of millions okay to start with. Uh, and so i think because of all those reasons i do not think personally i would love to be proved wrong but i do not think personally that there's going to be that kind of deep tech build, building here that is happening in two or three other countries uh, where we will obviously i think where india will find a Niche is in the application space. That's okay. Right. In the fine tuning of models for local context, etc., which doesn't require that much, the inferencing part, which doesn't require that much compute, etc., and that level of talent. But I think if you're one of those hundred guys, you will not be sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. And I think that's a straight answer. Um, it reminds me of when Sam Adler was visiting India, and I think Rajan Anand uh, of Peak 15 asked him this question, right? That uh, what do you think about somebody in India building a foundation model like yours, but let's say a $10 million check. And you know, Sam, you know, gave at that time a very straight answer. I said, look, I, said, I would say, don't even waste your time, right? Uh, he got a little panned by it because obviously people like politically correct answers, but that's the truth, right? We are talking about billions of dollars being spent at this point in time, right? Uh, no, let, let's hope that something happens. I think even uh, if you were to go back 40 years back, even getting a basic computer out here was a big issue, right? And yeah. in India, yeah. it was... So, you know, at some point, the whole playing field kind of got level. And then, of course, India emerged really strong. But still, India has really not been in the game of OS. It's always been on the application side, right? Uh, any uh, parting thoughts? I think I think it's been a fantastic conversation again with you, Jaspreet. But, you know, any parting thoughts about the future, the, the ethical considerations, or, or what has been the most unexpected or the most surprising built out that you've seen happening in, uh, in AI out here, in, in, the, in the generative robot space? Like every morning is something unexpected or surprising. I'm very honest. Okay. Um, very true. You know, so it's difficult to frankly single out one. Uh, today, someone was, I was on a Zoom call with someone who said, Jaspeet, I have a selfish question to ask you. 
Because mm-hmm. I cannot do this. How do you manage to keep up with everything? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't. I can't. Okay. Uh, because there's so much exciting stuff. So we're living in very exciting times. There's like 100 exciting things happening uh, uh, almost on a, a weekly basis. Uh, right. So it's very difficult for me to uh, pick up one. But personal excitement, which has happened to me, and uh, I'm, we're not going to, let's leave that as a teaser for the audience for a later talk, is that a particular AI hardware called a Rabbit R1, yeah. uh, which probably think of it as the first smartphone of the post smartphone era, first agent based smartphone. Yeah. So I got a mail, I, I, I had ordered it on the first day that it came out. And I've just got a mail that while it's been de- delayed a little bit, you know, they'll start shipping soon. And I think right. that is the real hardware revolution beyond robotics, that is uh, which uh, I'm, I, I think we should talk about one day. Yeah, I think the AI pins, I mean, of course, uh, some people have been disappointed by the demos, but some of them have been, you know, very, very fascinating. And I think that can itself be a very interesting topic for and one of us. It doesn't matter. Like, rabbit might fail. AI pin yeah. also fail. That's not the point. Right. The point is that these things have started happening. They've started coming. Very true. No, so I think uh, on that note, Jaspeet, I think thanks again. This was a fantastic 40-50 minutes spent with you. Really opened up my thoughts on on really on the development that's happening. And I'm sure the viewers out here would have really, really enjoyed this thing. So uh, till we meet next time, you know, have a good week. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks and great, uh, great to have this chat again. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.